Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, for anybody that doesn't know me, I'm Sarah Calvin, um, and I'm one of the museum officers with Cosmic Coast and Glens Borough Council's Museum Services. So I know you've heard from Nick and from Helen, um, so they're hard acts to follow. So you've got me now. So I'm going to talk about Corian Museum's mm -hmm. Sam Henry collection, and I'll start sharing my screen. This will take me a wee minute. This computer is a little bit slow. Okay, so has that come up yet for everybody? Not just yet, yeah. Sarah. Okay, let me know when it does. That's you know. <laughs> yeah. Grand. Um, so I shouldn't say this, but, but Sam Henry's collection is definitely one of my favourites in the museum. And hopefully by the time I finish this, you'll maybe understand a little bit why. So um, up on the screen there, I have photographs of Sam. The first one is him at Dundas Castle. Then there's him with Katie Glass on Rathlin Island, um, him playing the tin whistle on Rathlin Island, and the last one is Harriet Brownlow, who was a singer. Um, so I'm going to go back to whenever I first found out about the collection. So I started working for Korea Museum in November 2009, and it wasn't long after I started that I got a phone call from Gordon Craig inviting me to come and take a look at his grandfather Sam Henry's collection as the family were considering donating it to the museum. Now, being completely honest, I had never heard of Sam Henry. And I remember doing a really quick Google search and all that came up really was about the Songs of the People collection, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a wee minute. Um, so I really didn't know what to expect, um, but I got there and these are some of the photographs that I took. Um, so Gordon took me into his dining room and I had been taken over with boxes upon boxes of papers, letters, diaries. There was his bird eye collection, photographs, books, newspaper proofs, and so much more. Um, Gordon left me to explore the boxes. And as I started to look through the collection, I began to realize the richness of the material um, that it contained. So the first thing that struck me was all the connections that ran through everything and linked it together. So you could pick up a photograph of a person and in another box, you might find a letter from them or a song that they'd given to Sam um, to Sam's collection, or even an article, a newspaper article that Sam had written about them. And that's one of the things for me that makes the collection so special. So Dr. John Molden, who's a known authority on the collection, he summed it up perfectly when he said that Sam was motivated by his love of people. And this is so evident throughout his papers and photographs and makes the collection truly unique. So yes, it's the Sam Henry collection, but it's also about all the people he photographed, all the people he collected songs from, um, and all the people he corresponded with and was friends with and worked with, which makes it really, really different and really lovely. Um, fortunately for us, Gordon did decide, uh, Gordon and the family, sorry, did decide to donate the Sam Henry collection to Korean Museum, and we've been working away with it ever since. So who is Sam? Or who was Sam? So Sam was born in Korean in 1878, He's best known as a folklorist and recognised for his Songs of the People collection that ran in the Northern Constitution newspaper between 1923 and 1939. He worked as a pensions and excise officer and he said, in my contact with the old who have all now passed away, I had the rare privilege of sharing their folklore and their old songs. Sam's daughter Olive told Gail Huntingdon, editor of the Songs of the People book, that her father often took a spittle um, or tin whistle with him when he was visiting elderly people in the country to assess them for their pension. He would play a tune and then ask if anyone knew the old songs. Usually they did, and in this way, he managed to obtain songs for a series. Olive referred, to, Olive referred to Sam's tin whistle as a gadget. So he used it to find common ground with the people he was visiting and as such managed to preserve songs that otherwise may have been lost. And there are photographs like that very first one on the first slide of Sam sitting outside with his notebook, taking down, we presume, a tune or lyrics of a song. So Songs of the People is the biggest collection of folk songs in the interwar period in Ulster. It was a weekly series that ran in a local newspaper, the Northern Constitution, which published songs known, played and sang by people in Northern Ireland. 
Sam was the instigator of the series. He collected the vast majority of the songs and lyrics, and he was the editor of the column between 1923 and 1939. At the time, the collection was unique, and it continues to be of importance due to its size. The fact that it published the music with the lyrics, Sam wanted these songs to be sang. Um, its popularity, and um, because it captures and celebrates an important aspect of our cultural history. So the collection is huge. There is over 850 songs in the collection contributed by members of the public and people that Sam met through his work. So I could talk more about the songs and it might not mean an awful lot. And um, there are lots of songs in the collection, as I said, some you would know, some you probably never heard of. There is definitely lots I'd never heard of. Um, but I'm gonna play one and I'm pretty sure you might know this and feel free to sing along because I think most of you are on mute so nobody will hear. When I go home, the boys won't leave the girls alone. I pull my hair and stole my comb, but that's all right till I go home. She is handsome, she is pretty, she is the belle of Belfast City. She is the Gordon one, two, three. Please, won't you tell me who is she? Albert Mooney. He says he loves her, all the boys are fighting for her Rapping on the doors, ringing on the bell, singing Oh my true love, are you well? Up she comes as white as snow Rings on her fingers and bells on her toes Old Johnny Murray says she'll die If she doesn't give a fella a ruin eye Tell me ma, when I go home The boys won't leave the girls alone Pull my hair and stole my comb That's all right till I get home She is handsome, she is pretty she is the belle of Belfast City She is the curtain, one, two, three Please, won't you tell me who is she? Let the wind and the rain and the hail blow high The soap come tumbling from the sky She's as nice as apple pie She'll get her own lad by and by When she gets a lad of her own She won't tell her ma when she comes home Let them all come as they will For it's Albert Mooney she loves still but Tell me ma when I go home The boys won't leave the girls alone Pull my hair and stole my comb And it's all right till I get home She is handsome, she is pretty She is the belle of Belfast City She is a court in one, two, three Please would you tell me who is she I Tell me ma when I get home The boys won't leave the girls alone I Pull my hair and stole my comb And that's all right till I get home She is handsome, she is pretty She is the belle of Belfast City She is a court in one, two, three Please would you tell me who is she Okay, so that was I'll Tell Me Ma, recorded for us by Junior Johnson. So a great number of the songs were collected across the Causeway region. And for anyone interested, the Songs of the People book there on the screen has a fantastic geographical index at the back, which locates um, where a song was collected. So usually each song was printed with a few lines about who donated the words or the air. And I'm gonna look at just a few examples of these. So in the notes for the song, Kearney's Glen, Sam writes that the tune was collected over a hedge from a farmer, Charlie Freel, plowing his fields. Charlie left his wife with the plowing horses while he whistled and sang the tune across the hedge to Sam Henry. Mrs. John Roe McNeil, um, who's the older lady in the photograph there, she was known locally as Maggie Archer. She lived at Glen Duntops. And there's a copy of a letter in the collection, which you can see on the screen as well, which makes reference to a bargain between her and Sam that in return for a much needed kettle, she would send Sam 10 songs. The kettle cost 10 six, and if she had not 10 songs, Sam gave her the option to pay the balance in cash. But of course he knew that he had, she had 10 songs and probably more. So um, in a BBC radio interview about Sam Henry in, the 19, in 1978, Jack McBride recalls this trip. And so I have a short clip um, from that radio interview I'm gonna play for you now. Jack McBride, Glenn's man and journalist, reveals how Sam Henry, with its innate knowledge and sympathy, could win so much music from his neighbours. Sam asked me would I come with him to go around by Glendon because it was a district he didn't think had been covered beforehand. We went up to this house and uh, <laughs> I remember it was during the war and things were sort of tight. And... Sam went into the house and he asked this lady would she mind uh, telling him a few stories. And she said no. 
she would. So Sam was all delighted and she made us tea. Anyway, she started to hum when she was, you know, the way they, over the fire and taking the crook out and all that and lifting the pot off. And she started to hum. And Sam's ears perked up. He says, what is that? Do you know the words that? I do indeed, she she. Every word of it. I mind it well. I got it from my granda. Well, Sam says, would you mind singing it for me? Aye, surely. And here Sam has the book out and he's noting down all the time and tonic soul for the music. But at the finish, she says, do you know, sir, there's one thing I'm terribly annoyed about. And what would that be, says she? She she imagine me giving you the tea made in an old black pot, she says, instead of a decent kettle. She says, and I've been trying down in Cushendall and there's nobody seems to have one at all and even tried in Bellamina and I hadn't any. Ah, uh, Sam says, your problem solved. He says, I have a broil up in Coleraine cool and if he hasn't got one, there's not one in the whole British Isles. <laughs> so about uh, a week or ten days after that, Mrs McNeil got a beautiful kettle. It wasn't the like it she said in the whole glen. <laughs> and the letter then you see beside is um, thanking Sam for the kettle for Mrs McNeil and we know that she upheld her side of the bargain because we have a couple of songs there in the collection um, that obviously she sent and Sam is typed up there so the song Mary 18 was given to Sam by John Henry Macaulay of Ballet Castle and John contributed at least 21 songs to the series if not more Sam has a list of songs dating from the 26th of September 1925, which you can see up on the slide there, of songs that belong to John. Um, and this included the well-known song, The Owl Lammas Fair. John grew up on a farm in Glenchesk and due to an accident when he was young was disabled. He was taught to carve wood and opened a shop on Anne Street in Bally Castle, known as the Bog Oak Shop. He carved model jaunting cars, round towers, brooches, as well as pendants with views of Bally Castle out of ancient Bog Oak. He was a well-known fiddle player and songwriter. Bally Castle featured John on their heritage trail, which includes a photograph of him, which we don't have in Sam's collection. You can see that on the slide there too. And there also is a plaque dedicated to Macaulay above McLister's shop in Bally Castle. So a few other examples of Sam's notes that would have accompanied songs. So the song Kathleen, collected at a smokers concert at Malachy's Reading Room, Corian. John Blunt from Tom Black of Crokin, now in his 89th year, who learned it sitting on his father's knee, or Chun, noted from Pat O'Kane's fiddling, who learned it from his father, Bernard, who learned it from his father. So Sam is so careful to record where the song has come from, knowing how often it's passed down through families orally. So a great number of these songs may never have been written down before, let alone put into print. Sam was unable to publish the songs as a book in his lifetime. Um, instead, he sent copies of the collection to the Belfast Public Library, the National Library of Ireland in Dublin, and the Library of Congress in Washington in America. And it was the work of Gail Huntington, Lanny Herman, and John Molden that saw the largest publication of Sam's collection in the Songs of the People book, um, published in 1990. And I lifted a quote from one of Sam's radio broadcasts about the Songs of the People collection, which I think illustrates the importance of the archive. And he said, um, and so we see that an old song is much more than an old song. It is a picture of days long, of long ago, of past social life, old frivolous loves, battles, ships, emigrations, and in Bam's dialect, like bees in amber. In such songs, Ulster has an unusual and valuable heritage. So I'm gonna go back to Tom Black, who I mentioned. Um, so I did a search for Tom in the 1911 census um, and at that time he was 68, he was a Thatcher and he lived with his wife Eliza who was 45 and they appear to have been married for only four years. So I talked earlier about the connections that run through the collection. So Sam has several photographs of Tom and you can see one there on the slide. Um, he's a newspaper article about him and then he has songs, copies of his songs as well. So in this article you can see on the screen, Sam writes, 
It is pleasant to be remembered after 30 years by those who have no blood ties with you, but whose only bond is genuine affection. A well-to-do farmer from a hilly district told me the other day that Tom Black, aged 93, wanted to see me again. I remembered him clearly in his one bedroom house a generation ago when I took him his pension book. He wore a rabbit skin cap and trousers glazed with age. And I think you can really see that in the photograph. Um, Tom's house is more a man's nest than a house. On the ashes which he throws out the front door, a precarious patch of potatoes grow. In his drab cottage, there is one article that is kept with loving care, his fiddle. So Sam goes on in the article then to talk about the songs that Tom played for them, providing all the words, and he marveled on his fantastic memory for 93. So the article concludes then, relentless bus demanded that we should leave. As we came through the meadow and over the burn, there floated the strains of his fiddle from that penthouse against the hill. The melodies got sweeter as he warmed up to it. We stopped to listen in the silence of the bosky glen, and I said to my chum, isn't it like a beautiful hidden voice from the heart of nature? So I don't have a recording of Tom Black playing the fiddle, but I thought I would play you this one, and this is Emma Mulholland playing. So just to give you another example of uh, ways that Sam collected songs. So in a radio broadcast, and I'll talk a little bit more about his radio broadcast in a wee minute or two, um, he writes, um, it was by the hospitable hearth of Willie Reed in a bosky nook near Garva. The guest of honour was old John Parker, then in his 80s, who in his young days used to sing for two miles of the road to lighten the hearts of the workers as they walked in the dark winter mornings to their daily toil in Mullamore Bleach Green. John had most unusual songs, some from the 17th century and some original versions that had eluded Robert Burns in his song searches. Neighbours had gathered in and after tea for all, John took the armchair by the big turf fire and started to sing. Once he'd started, he could not stop. And knowing this, I had met with me my friend, Mr. Alfie Boyd, principal of Collie Capital Primary School and Mr. Dan Duffy, a shorthand writer. On that wonderful evening, we bagged 17 songs. And as John has passed hence, we thus preserve from oblivion songs that otherwise would have been lost. So you can see on the screen there the typed version of one of the songs that Sam collected that night, um, The Owl Man and the Churn Staff. Junior Johnson recorded a version of this for us as well, so I'm going to play it. You will notice, though, that the words um, that are typed there are slightly different from the words in the song. And I didn't know very much about folk music when I started looking at Sam Henry's collection, but um, Anybody that does know a little bit about folk music will tell you that it evolves over time. So the words can change um, just by whatever people are singing now um, compared to then. And as the tunes can change a little bit as well. So that explains a little bit about the difference. So I'll play this for you now. There was a woman from our town, in our town she did dwell. She loved her husband dearly, and another one twice as well. Me tickery tickery tooram, and me tooram tooram da. She went to the doctor's shop, some medicine for to find. She said, Will you give me something that'll make me old man blind? With me tickery tickery tooram, and me tooram tooram da.
Oh, the doctor gave her marrow bones and bitter grind them fine And rub them in your almond eyes and that will make him blind With me tickery tickery tourum and me tourum tourum da Oh, I am tired of this world, I'm tired of me life I think I'll go and drown myself in that land of strife With me tickery tickery tourum and me tourum tourum da They both went out together till they came to the river brim. He says, you'll take a run and race and you must push me in. Put me tickery tickery tourum and me tourum tourum da. So they both went out together till they came to the river's brim. But when she came up behind him, he pushed her in. Now with me tickery tickery tourum and me tourum tourum da. Well, so loudly she did bawl, so loudly she did yell. I heard your wishes, he sure I can't see you at all. For me tickery tickery tourum and me tourum tourum da. Oh, well, sometimes she rose to the surface and tried to catch the brim. But the old man with the churn staff, he tried to push her in. For me tickery tickery tourum and me tourum tourum da. When he thought she'd had enough, he took her to dry land. He says, I think the notion's off, you have another man. But me tiggery tiggery tourum 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 da. Me tiggery tiggery tourum and me tourum tourum da. Okay, so it has been documented that Sam censored the songs of the People series. That song you just heard is probably about as risky as it gets. Um, an obvious reason that he may have censored the collection um, was that the Northern Constitution would have been a family newspaper. So he was censoring it for his audience. Um, but other people, but also people may have felt uncomfortable giving Sam certain songs. He was, after all, a government official. Um, I asked the singer, folk singer Len Graham, more about this. And he told me that in 1939, Sam Henry had a footnote to the banks of the Clyde saying, can any reader in the Braid district near Ballymena supply a song called the Loch Do Poachers, which is wanted by a reader in New Zealand? The song never appeared in the Songs of the People series, and Len asked his uncle Willie, um, who had given him the song and others, why he hadn't sent the song to Sam Henry. And he said, are you mad? Sure, one of your ancestors is mentioned in the song, which dated from 1882, and I'm keeping up the family tradition. Another man gave one song to Sam, but again, when he heard his real job, he didn't give any more, as his father was making pot sheen at the time, and he didn't want to bring an excise man about the place. Len also heard that he prosecuted, that Sam prosecuted some publicans for selling pot sheen, and the word went round, which wouldn't have done him any favours. Um, but Len, and he always wants me to say this, is that none of that takes away from the importance of the Songs of the People collection and the work that Sam was doing at the time. So as well as printing the series in the Northern Constitution, Sam shared his collection through radio broadcasts on BBC and Radio Erin. His first broadcast was in May 1925, which was the, within the first year of uh, radio broadcasting in Ireland. His last known broadcast seems to have been in 1946. So in almost 20 years, Sam presented radio broadcasts on lots of different topics. Examples include Ulster's Heritage of Song series in 1935 and 1937, Undiscovered Ulster series in 1938, and The Adventures of a Song Hunter in 1940. The programme Old Customs and Legends of Ulster by Sam was broadcast to 200 radio stations in North America in 1937. And often during these radio broadcasts, he was accompanied by singers, including James McCafferty and Harriet Brownlow, and musicians such as fiddler James Keeley. And I have pictures up here of William Stevenson, um, a member of the family came along to a talk I did quite a few years ago and was able to share this photograph with me that you see on the right hand side. And that was during a broadcast that they did at Sam Henry's house. I don't know anybody else in the photograph off the top of my head, but I know that that's William there on the left hand side. So in 1906, Sam purchased his first camera and he recorded its arrival in his 1906 diary. And at the back of this diary, he lists the first photographs that he took and developed. 
and over the next 50 years, he photographed people and places across the region, leaving behind an intriguing view of his world. He captured people that he visited, that he worked with, his friends, as well as places across the region. And many of these would have featured in local newspapers, um, the Derry and Andrew Muir books, and even in some of the books that he published. So to date, we have scanned about 3,000 photographs, negatives and glass slides. Some are copies or prints of the negatives, but it still is a substantial collection. So I have a couple here just at the Balamoney area. So with Balamoney Town Hall there and Lisner Castle. So this next photograph was captioned Balnamore Mill Girl. And we knew nothing else about her. So through our Connecting with the Past, Collecting for the Future project funded by Esme Fairburn Collection Fund and administrated by the Museums Association, we were able to share Sam's collection with some local community groups. One of these groups was the Causeway Yarn Spinners. And Maud Steele, a member of this group, spotted this photograph when she was having a look through the collection. And she was able to tell us so much more about the Balnamore Mill Girl. So I'm going to let Maud fill you in because she tells it far better than I would. Sam Henry, as you have heard before, was a keen photographer and also a historian who was interested in ordinary working people doing jobs, which he had the foresight to photograph for his collection. He probably realized that many of these people and their activities were fast disappearing with no historical record and could easily be forgotten in the future. In his collection, there are a number of photos showing workers in the linen industry during the 1930s. Some of these appeared in a book, this one, called Rooms of Time by Cahill Dallet. My brother bought this one for me. Uh, one of these photographs was simply entitled Balnamore Mill near Ballymoney around 1930s. In this photo was a pretty girl, a moment, frozen in time, posing for the camera in her bare feet, as the mill workers in the spinning department had to do in those days. She was standing in front of a very complicated looking machine, wearing her work apron with a series of implements hanging from her waist, her pickers, as I later learned, these enabled her to do quite a dangerous job, joining up threads in the spinning process. Quite a stylish lady, in fact, for a factory worker. But who was this mystery girl? How could we find out? No name had been attached to the photograph. Now, I knew a lady who had worked in Balnamore Mill at around that time. So I showed the picture to her. And guess what? She said, that's me. <laughs> what a surprise. At this time, this lady was in her 70s and had never seen this photo before, but she certainly remembered the day that it was taken. She told me that the mill owner and another man had come on a Sunday afternoon and asked if she would go down to the mill to have her photo taken in front of the machines that she normally operated. She said she didn't want to go by herself, so she took her friend Greta with her, but that the man only wanted to take her photo. So now we knew. Her name was Emily Anderson, or Sissy, as she was affectionately known, born on the 30th of November, 1930 which was the year after the sinking of the Titanic and the year before the outbreak of the First World War. Historic times. She was one of eight children. She had four sisters and three brothers. And at the age of 14, had started work in Balnamore Mill, where some of her relatives already worked. There she worked hard and progressed to the position of doffing mistress. Times were hard and... Pay was low in those days, but she loved her work and enjoyed helping everybody. In her 20s, she met and married a man from Risharkin, where they eventually settled and reared eight children, six boys and two girls. 
As well as looking after her own family, she cooked and cleaned for her widowed father-in-law and did caretaking duties for the church. No oil-fired central heating in those days. Buckets of coal had to be carried in on Saturday nights and boilers lit early on Sunday mornings regardless of rain, hail, sleet or snow. All this was done cheerfully and with a song on her lips. She had a lifelong love of music, having sung in several prize-winning choirs in her youth. She possessed a rich, strong, melodic voice and was often in demand to sing solos at weddings and other events. She could bring a tear to your eye with her soulful rendering of Oft in the Stilly Night or Nearer My God to Thee, which she always informed us was the last tune played on the Titanic as it sank. She was undoubtedly the best alto singer that they had ever had in Richard and Church Choir during the 40 years that she was a faithful member. As a hostess, she was superb. Everyone was made welcome in her house. Her generosity and helpfulness was well known to family, friends and neighbours alike, all of whom would testify that she was a great wee woman. Sadly, she lost her husband in 1974 and her son in 1992, but she carried on bravely playing a significant part in the upbringing of her 27 grandchildren and helping and supporting all the families in every possible way. In later years, when her health began to deteriorate, she still managed to attend family gatherings and weddings of her grandchildren. And here she is at 90, dressed, ready for a wedding, still a stylish lady. I'm sure Sam would still have found her an interesting subject for a photograph. And how do I know all this? Well, I am very proud to say she was my mother-in-law. Um, so Maud tells that absolutely brilliantly. Um, I get goosebumps every time I listen to it. Um, and she like, it just shows how important it is that we share our collections. If Maud hadn't seen that photograph, it probably still would be sitting in a box and we wouldn't know who the lovely girl was in the photograph. Um, so it just is so important and we're just so grateful to have that information, which is so valuable. Um, so in other instances, and more often than not, to be fair to Sam, he did name the people in his photographs and he has captured information about them and their lives. So on this one, you can see a photograph of Rachel Cameron. And I'll just read you a little bit about what he wrote about her. So this was used in the 1923 edition of the Darian Andrew Muir book. Um, so he says the portrait was taken when the subject of it, Mrs. Cameron of Ballyray, Port Rush, and formerly of Ballinreath near Corian, was in her 103rd year. She was born at Ballinreath in 1821, um, not many months after George IV ascended the throne. And though she has lived in five reigns, she is still able to move about the house daily and occasionally to walk out, sometimes alone in calm and sunny weather. In her long life, she has never had any serious illness um, and only at rare intervals has she taken medicine. And her daughter-in-law says she never remembers her taking food which disagreed with her. So if that's what it takes to get to 103, I think I will leave it and just continue to eat. <laughs> um, so Sam Henry wrote and gave lectures um, across Ulster on various subjects such as folklore, birds, nature, folk songs, and Ulster life. From Castle Rock to Newcastle, Sam traveled widely to numerous locations, providing lectures in churches, town halls, schools, and lecture halls. In many of these, he would have sang songs from his collection, played his violin and his tin whistle to bring the songs to life. He used his photographs um, as lantern slides, and they were used to illustrate his lectures with many newspaper reviews, noting that at times over 100 slides were shown to audiences. So Sam estimated that by 1942, he had lectured around 300 times, given his last known lecture in 1948. And a diary entry um, in 1907 indicates that he had been lecturing since the early 20th century. So it was agreed in 1940 that Sam would offer his services as lecturer to, lecturer to the troops stationed in Northern Ireland during World War II. 
and the war years with CSAM providing 170 lectures to the troops as extramural lecture under the Queen's University Belfast scheme. And this is a quote, um, Mr. Henry was a favorite among British and American troops during the last war. They greatly appreciated his lectures and conducted tours. Sam educated troops with his extensive knowledge on Ulster. Lectures were titled Aspects of Life in Ulster, Romantic Ulster, A Tour Through Northern Ireland, Ulster and America, Ireland, the land and its people, and Ulster, the land and its people. In 1946, Sam wrote of his experience with the troops during World War II. In the evenings at the American Red Cross HQ in Portrush, I gave the men lantern talks on what they had seen and on, on Ulster generally. I also met the troops in other localities. The climax of my lantern engagements was on board a splendid hospital ship lying in Belfast Lock. So as well as lecturing, Sam was a keen writer and it's really nice to have his typewriter in the collection. He published articles. I've spoken a little bit about his newspaper articles and um, poems and several books. And these included A Hank of Yarns, The Story of St. Patrick's Quarry and Don't Listen the Giant's Causeway, which is on the screen there. Tales of the Antrim Seaboard and he edited and illustrated Rolock Rhymes with photographs and that was by North Antrim um, who was Robert McMullen of Port Ballantrae. So A Hank of Yarns is a collection, an edit, edited collection of anecdotes and observations that Sam made and I think it really shows his sense of humour. Um, so I'm going to read you just a couple of little short extracts from A Hank of Yarns. So a lad left in the house while his mother went to the well for a go of water was tremendously excited and alarmed when he discovered a mouse in the cream crop. He rushed out and off to his mother. Ma, there's a mouse in the cream crop. His mother calmly asked, and did you not take it out? And the boy at once retorted, nah, but I threw in the cat. And then another one, um, a story is told of an American visitor who called at an Ulster farmhouse and asked for a drink. The woman of the house offered milk, which he gladly accepted, preferring buttermilk as the greater novelty. As he was seated drinking the milk from a bowl, a little pet pig, pig sorry, kept nuzzling his legs, evoking the remark from the visitor, I guess that little pig thinks he knows me. And the farmer's wife explained, it's not you that he knows, but his own wee bowl. So pupils from Tully Grawley Primary School created lino prints for a couple of Sam's books, and that included a hank of yarns and the story of St. Patrick's Church Corium. In the collection, we've letters from the school headmaster, Mr. Russell, who's photographed there um, just outside the school. And we photographed some of the children who created the lino prints, which is just above Mr. Russell there. And we've some of the actual lino pieces with their cut designs, as well as the prints, which you can see on the screen. So through simple lines and extreme precision, these young children have brought the animals and characters described in Sam's type to life. Many of the scenes they were asked to illustrate would have been familiar to these children, um, such as men working in the fields or the plowman. Others, such as images of fairies and the banshee, which you can see there, required imagination and creativity, which these children appeared to have in abundance. It links really nicely with a collection held by the Braid Museum in Ballymena of lino prints by the same children. And their collection also includes exercise books, drawings and poems by the children. So I mentioned our project and um, we worked with the Cosby Yarn Spinners, but we also worked with the Fort Stewart and Ballymoney writers. And Bernie McGill, um, the author, was part of this group. And she was inspired by the lino prints to write this piece. So I think at time it is. Yeah, I'll play this for you because it's really nice. My name's Bernie McGill. Uh, this piece is inspired by the lino cuts made by the children of Tully Grawley Public Elementary School, Cullabacky in 1939 and 1940 in response to Sam Henry's collected stories, originally published in the Corian Chronicle and later collected in a hank of yarns. The lino cutters. It's a tricky business, lino printing. You have to teach your brain to think back to front. If you use the scalpel the way you use the pencil, your picture will print in reverse. All the black you intended will come out white, and the white will come out black. 
like a chalk drawing on a slate. I find it hard to do this, to flip my seeing the way my mother can flip a soda on a griddle, but I'm doing my best for Mr. Henry and for Master Russell. The master says we're to do our neatest work and if the prints are judged by Mr. Henry to be of a standard to illustrate his column, not only will we have the pleasure of seeing our artwork circulated in print, but we will be liberally rewarded for our efforts. I take the scalpel the way the master showed us and make a deep cut in the lino and it goes in like a knife into butter, satisfying, deep. He says not to go the whole way to the end of the line, to use the smaller knife so as not to leave cross hatches. The ink will find every ridge, he says, leave every incision blank. The ink doesn't know which cuts were meant and which ones weren't, the master says. The ink is indiscriminate in that sense. The master has read us Mr. Henry's stories and we've each chosen the one we wish to illustrate. Sadie is tracing a group of fairies, hopping from one toadstool to another. Andy has made a peewit, guarding a nest of mottled eggs. Betty has carved an old couple, sitting by a crackling fire, winding a hank of yarn. I'm making a banshee. My banshee will have hollow eyes and spindly bones and her white sheet will drag along the ground like a ghoulish cloak behind her. Gouging out the sheet takes a long time. It's like cutting turf, Stanley says, bent over his work, but in miniature. And it's true that the lino, with its backing of hessian, is dark and fibrous and pliable, like something ancient and layered, laid down and dug up from the earth. Stanley is cutting a coat of arms, and he has to write backwards in Latin. Mrs. Russell has loaned him a small mirror for the purpose. Nuncia Pacis, it reads, harbinger of peace. I don't touch the background of my lino cut because I want it to come out black. The banshee only comes out at night after all, but the master says that the night is never truly black. Add some detail, Josiah. So I cut a line of rooftops and a chimney or two for effect. I'm leaning heavy on the knife and careful, careful, going round the banshee's eyes and nose when the master leaves the room to talk to Mrs. Russell and infants and I'm working on the banshee's teeth when out of the corner of my eye I see Laurie Buchanan slip off his shoe and spit a ball of paper into his hand. He pulls back the leather tongue as far as it'll go and sticks the pellet on the tongue of the shoe and catapults the paper across the room where it lands smack in my cheek. And even though I've seen it coming, I can't help but flinch. And the knife slips, and there's a cut now where one shouldn't have been. And then the master's back in the room, and there's nothing I can do except shoot Laurie my filthiest look and brush the disgusting ball of spit off my face. A cut in lino isn't going to heal, and I haven't time to start again. I just have to let it be. Nuncia Apaches. Stanley whispers to me and winks, and I have to laugh at that. We ink the lino with the rollers and make the prints and leave them in the store to dry, and the master says he'll decide next day which one to send Mr. Henry. All night I pray that mine will be good enough. The next morning, when the master lines the prints up on the bench at the front of the schoolroom, we all go to look. Jean's owl looks out at us from the leaves of a tree, head tilted, feathers preened, one sharp talon gripping a branch. Owen's wittret skulks over the grass, its long brush of a tail winding behind. Ned's cart driver grips the handle of the whip and the leather curves like a backwards S in the air and the horse lunges ahead. Jean's shoemaker is just about to take a cobbler's nail from between his lips. You could put your fingers in the ribs sticking out of the side of Andy's poor starving cow. The lobster in Owen's print looks like a second later 
it will break the knuckles of the fish seller's hand. They're crude, like cave paintings, like scratches on a wall. But here's the strange thing, a thing the master never told us would happen. In black and white, in lines, cut crooked and ragged and raw, every face contains an expression. Every picture tells a story as loud as if the wetrid had stuck its tail in its mouth and whistled, as if Jean's owl had called out twit twoo. You can almost smell the smoke from the chimneys, hear the clank of the shoemaker's hammer striking the nails. You can feel the tug as Billy's goat steals the long johns from where they're hanging on the clothesline. You can see every crease on the barefoot woman's brow. You can see too where my knife slipped when Andy fired the pellet at me. But it makes the banshee's mouth seem more jagged and fierce. And her eyes are looking straight into me, like I've just startled her, like she's the one running from me. I think that something mysterious must happen when you flip an image back to front. It's a whole new way of seeing. It's like the spirit of Mr. Henry's stories has entered into the prints with the ink, like they've all been possessed by something unseen to us. The master says, Mr. Henry will be delighted and that we're every one of us artists and we all go home feeling humbled, bewildered by the power of the marks that we ourselves made on a page thinking that maybe the master is some kind of magician with the secrets of the whole world buttoned up inside his tweed jacket and that Mr. Henry is not a collector of stories at all, but some kind of charmed ventriloquist. Um, so we have a great collection of Sam's correspondence as well. So I'm just going to talk about a few interesting people um, so we've letters from Louis Walsh, um, and not X-Factor Louis Walsh. Uh, Louis was a lawyer, a political activist, and a playwright born in Makara, County Londonderry. He practiced law in Bally Castle in the early 20th century. Um, i just uh, move on here. So George Shields, um, there's quite a lot of letters between Sam and George. He was an Irish dramatist whose plays were a success both in his native Ulster and in the Abbey Theatre in Dublin. So his most famous plays are The Rugged Path and The Passing Day. I'm just gonna go back here. You can see the letter on the left-hand side from Francis Joseph Bigger, a solicitor and a historian who financially supported many local cultural projects and commemorations. He was heavily involved in the Irish cultural revival. Hugh Sanders Blackham was an Irish journalist, writer and editor who referred to Sam Henry as a nationalist in one of his letters. Um, and I'll come back to that a little bit. And then Morris Walsh, who the letter is from on the right hand side. Morris was an Irish novelist. He's best known for the short story, The Quiet Man, which was later made into an Oscar winning movie directed by John Ford and starring John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. He was one of Ireland's best selling authors in the 1930s. So Sam has letters from correspondents all over the world, and that's only a couple of very quick examples. Um, our database, for example, it brings up over 2,500 letters. So we have the letters from people that maybe would have been well known, and then we have letters from um, Mrs. John McNeil, um, from local people, from John Henry Macaulay and Valley Castle. So there's all sorts in there. It's fantastic. Um, we have Sam's diaries for 1906, 1907, 1908, 1910, and then there is a big gap until 1934. Um, they give such a fantastic insight into his life, especially those early ones, because he'll write about where he traveled to, who he visits, um, books that he is reading, and generally what he's up to. And I'm just looking at that page there that I've put up. So you can see there, 9th of May, age 29 today. So it was his birthday. His birthday thoughts are nil. <laughs> so they're just a really lovely insight into his life and what he was thinking at the time. So he lived during such a turbulent period of history in Ireland. You've got World War II, World War I, sorry, World War II partition. And unfortunately, the gaps in the diaries correlate with those interesting years. Um, he was turned down for active service due to his occupation in 1916. And then in World War II, we mentioned how he lectured to the trips stationed in Northern Ireland and he often accompanied them on trips. 
So just some interesting things to note about Sam. He was clearly a Presbyterian and served as an, a unionist councillor, but his non-sectarian stance is recorded by others. So that's what I meant when I mentioned the letter where he was mentioned as a nationalist and also the songs as well. There's nothing political at all about the songs. There was very few political songs collected or ever printed. Um, so I've covered really briefly most of Sam's interests, areas of interest, um, and it would be impossible to include all of them in any sort of detail. So just to give you a little bit of a flavour of some of Sam's other hobbies and the associations he was involved in. So he was a keen ornithologist. He was a councillor for the urban district of Corian between 1939 and 1942. He was a member of the uh, Belfast Naturalist Field Club and he was president of the Root Naturalist Field Club. He was a chairman of the Korean Music Festival Association. He was a founder member of the New Row YMCA. He was a Sunday school teacher, an elder of New Row Presbyterian Church, a boys brigade officer, a member of Korean Rotary Club. I think he was president for a time as well of the Korean Rotary Club and of the Ulster Tourist Board. He was an extremely busy man and the collection reflects all of that. Um, so I have another just couple of recordings that I just want to finish with. Um, so I'm going to play your song first of all because I feel like you've been listening to a lot of just people speaking um, there for the past few couple of recordings. So this is Fear Abata. It was recorded by the choir on Rathlin, who also took part in our Connecting with the Past, Collecting for the Future project. And the photograph you see there is um, a boat leaving Rathlin. So I'll just play you their song. Yes. where that was collected from. So that was collected on Rathlin Island. Um, and it's noted as a Rathlin song. It was collected on the 18th of November, 1939. And it was from the Gaelic of Mrs. James Glass. It was Katie Glass that was in the very, one of the very first photographs with Sam. And it is world famous song and it's generally regarded as of Scottish Highlands origin. And then this is a poem and I'm going to finish with this one. Um, it's a poem written by Julie Agnew, who was part of the Portshire and Balamoney Writers group as well. A Writer of Letters by Julie Agnew. I wrote to you once, selected paper with care, not too thick, but heavy enough with intent, a proper fountain pen, well filled from a bottle of squid dark ink, sure in its purpose. 
In a time when feelings are tossed carelessly across continents in the blink of a cursor, it seemed fitting somehow that these words, these thoughts, took time. Nib poised with one glistening drop, I paused. Thought of all the times I'd thrown aside what should have been recorded. The missed opportunities where things left unsaid hung more heavily than those words we chose. Where I should have been scribe. That somewhere, yellowing in a drawer, should be, must be, the best parts of all of us. The bits we want to remember. How squirreled away in a land not my own, I'd squealed at a pigeonhole crammed with paper, letting me in on who did what with whom, wrapping me in a hug all the more potent for the miles. And me, responding on pages torn from a file block, sent back love, hidden in the humdrum, the minutiae of me. They called them collections, bound in heavy leather and cloistered at the back of our library. Correspondence from dreamers and fighters and lovers of life long gone. Here in their pages was the out loud thinking of some who graced the pictures in my history texts and some who merely breathed in my head, their words no less potent for the not remembering. Back in this corner of writers and gatherers, I find in yellowing pages another who seized the moment, who scribed ink blotted and sure of script, the stories of those he fell among, shared with those who would care for them as his own, whose voice carried alongside his words, filled with warmth and belonging, a gatekeeper of memories, a writer of letters. Um, I just really love that poem. I think for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's sort of... Um, a plug for me to everybody to write down their memories and things that they feel are important that they would want people to know. Um, it even makes me think about your photographs. Anybody that has those photographs, write the dates on them, write your, the names of people on them because it's so meaningless without that. And also it just makes me think about receiving a letter in the post and how much joy that can bring. You send so many emails now and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way life has changed and how we work now, but there is nothing better than receiving a letter in the post. So if this talk encourages you to do anything, I would encourage you to sit down and write a letter to somebody and send it over the weekend. Um, so I am gonna stop sharing now that that's me done. So I can answer if anybody has any questions. Okay, thanks so much, Sarah. That was just lovely. It was lovely to hear all those recordings and the music. It was really beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, so I have a couple of questions here that um, have come through the chat and then we'll just open it up to whoever has any more. Um, so Zahid was asking, what is the Bog Oak Shop? Um, so it was a shop in Ballycastle um, that John Henry Macaulay ran. So he was taught to carve um, Bog Oak and he carved like, different things. I think there was pendants and different little uh, figurines and things like that. And he would have sold them from the shop. So the shop was in Ballycastle. And um, there still is a Macaulay shop in Ballycastle, but the plaque which um, was put up for him is actually above McLister's shop, which is right beside the Macaulay shop. But I assume that the Macaulay shop was where, where John would have had his bog oak shop. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much, yeah. Uh, okay, and bog oak, Sarah, is that? kind of that's that's wood that's been in a bog is that right and laying in earth for a while is that yeah. is that correct yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. that's what i understand as i don't know nick might be able to tell us a little bit more about that he maybe know more but is he <laughs> <laughs> no okay no no that that's my understanding as well okay all right Good stuff. Um, and also then, um, no, I didn't, I wasn't quick enough to write down, down the name, but the guy with the fiddle beside the shed, um, is it somebody Kelly, Tom Kelly, was it, or John Tom Kelly? Black. 
Oh, black. black. There we go. I got one, one yeah. name right at least. <laughs> um, so he was asking, <laughs> was that song related to the Titanic? Do you know the song that the young woman was playing on the, the fiddle or the violin? Um, no, that is, is it My Sally's Garden or Down in My Sally's Garden? Um, no, as far as I know, it wasn't at all. Um, I actually have some notes written down about that. That was collected from George Graham, Crossley and Corian, from the late Willie McKay in Park Street, who learned it in Toronto and Canada. Um, and it also has some connection to the poet. Uh, so um, as far as I know, no connection to the Titanic. Oh, okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so uh, I had just a question about the song um, sung by Rathal and Choir, the name of it, Sarah? Uh, Vera, Vara Vata is how I think you pronounce it. Um, I should probably put up how it's spelled. It translates as the boatman. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so well, lovely. It's beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, okay. Yeah. Has anybody, um, anybody got any other questions just in the group? Pearl? Pearl, you're on mute. Um, I just want to say that I was part of the Causeway Yarn Spinners who had a look at Sam Henry's collection and it is just amazing. And maybe, um, Sarah, you could tell them how they could have access or, the, or can they have access to it? I loved reading his diaries. They were so funny. Um, one of his poems, he wrote a poem about Tammany Rankin, and I decided that I would go to Tammany Rankin. Um, it's a court tomb, and I googled it on my... Um, I googled it and it said it was 14 minutes from my home and I had never heard of it, never knew where it was. So I took my husband off one Sunday afternoon and we went to Tamney Rankin. Um, it's on the road between Swatra and um, Garfa, isn't that right? And you have to go up a very, very long lane. And then when I got up there, I read his poem. And it said that you could see the mountains of Morn. And I thought, now that maybe is a bit of artistic license. And I was coming along the road and I saw a man and I stopped. He was painting his gate or something. And I stopped with him and I said, excuse me, can, can you see the mountains of Morn from here? And he sort of looked at me at first. Then I explained about, um, about what I wanted. And he said, yes, on a good day, you can see the mountains of Morn from up near Swatra. And it was just a lovely poem that he wrote. The man that I stopped with knew all about Sam Henry and he called his house Tyree. And that's one of the songs. Um, and he told me the whole story about the man going from Swatra to um, America. He wrote the poem, he sent it home and then he came home himself. So I had a wonderful time um, working on the project with the Causeway Yarn Spinners. So thank you, Sarah. No, thank you. We loved working with the Causeway Yarn Spinners because you wrote a fabulous poem as well. And we got loads of lovely stuff because I love Maud's story too. It's brilliant. And Jennifer, it was, it was really, really good. Um, to answer the question about the collection, at the minute, um, we have no access uh, for the public into the offices. I don't know when that'll change, um, but obviously when it does and we can, we're more than happy to, to share the collection with anybody that wants to see it. Um, in the meantime, uh, there is quite a lot of the collection on the NI Archive website. Um, Nick can maybe write in the, or maybe we have the link somewhere that you know, we can share with you, but um, that's the only access at the minute, unfortunately. Thank you. No problem. Okay, any other questions, anybody? No, thank God it's us. All good. I think everybody really enjoyed that. Um, mm -hmm. Sarah, so maybe you want to go and look at old photos and, and write the names on them. I think that's just a uh -huh. wonderful suggestion. Uh -huh. You know, so thank you so much. And uh, we'll see everybody next week for our last talk then. Um, Nick will be here for that, um, along with uh, Frankie Cunningham from the Orange Order and um, as well Siobhan. Uh, Siobhan, my goodness, her name is completely <laughs> gone now for me. <laughs>
<laughs> That's terrible. We have a representative from AOH as well. Um, so Sharon Kearns, there you go. That was in there somewhere. Um, so we'll see you next week for that. And uh, hope you all enjoyed that. Thanks very much. And thanks very much. Just, just before you log off, uh, I have put a link to the Sam Henry collection in the chat there. But I know that Lisa will send around an email tomorrow with links to the video. And if you have a look at the NI archive link that is in that email, um, that will also have a link to it, to the collection. So you can go in that way as well. Thanks. Uh, Lisa, uh, um, uh, I have a request. Could you please send us the song, what uh, today played uh, uh, in, in these presentations? Uh, is it possible to send us the songs? Uh, I'll ask Sarah about that. Yeah, um, yeah that, that should be fine. fine. Yeah. yeah, we'll get something okay. sorted. Sunday, Sunday <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll be very nice, fantastic to hear that again. The, problems, the, heat, the songs were beautiful, weren't they? Yeah. Send, send the recording. Send the recording, say, Sila. We'll try, try our best, Naresh. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. okay. thank you very much. Everybody. Take care Bye. now. Good night, Bye. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.